بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين All praise and thanks belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and may the peace and blessing of Allah be upon his servant and final messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam As to what follows my dear respected brothers and sisters in Islam Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Tonight we continue with the second dhikr which comes after Ayat Al-Kursi and we said that is Al-Mu'awwidhat and we said that Al-Mu'awwidhat refers to Surah Al-Ikhlas or Surah Al-Falaq or Surah Al-Nas and today we are with the first of the Mu'awwidhatayn which is Surah Al-Falaq that's the first of the Mu'awwidhatayn now we're going to speak first about some of its virtues um, of Surah Al-Falaq and Surah Al-Nas uh, together because their virtues come together. In the first one, this is a hadith in Sahih Muslim that Uqba ibn Amir al-Juhani radiyallahu anhu narrated. And he said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Alam tara ayat unzilat al-layla lam yura mithlahunna qat. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, out of amazement and shock, he said such words, to Uqba ibn Amir radiallahu anhu. He said to him, Have you not seen the verses Allah Azza wa Jal revealed to me in the night? This alam tara, it implies shock and amazement. He's excited in Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He's saying to him, Have you not seen and heard of the ayat that Allah Azza wa Jal revealed to me in the night? And then he said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the likes of which has never ever been seen before. These are unique, incredible ayat. They are قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ فالنبي صلى الله عليه وسلم was excited when these ayat and these two suwar were revealed and we're going to speak about their relevance and the importance in the life of a Muslim and then you'll understand why we're reading them three times in the morning, three times in the evening once after every salat and three times before you sleep the second virtue <coughs> النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم it was narrated that he used to seek refuge in Allah from the jinn and from the evil eye. Initially at the beginning, he used to seek Allah's protection from al-jinn and from the evil eye by making dua. And all the time the dua would change. He used to make words in dua form and he would seek Allah's protection from al-jinn and the evil eye. The narration says, حَتَّى نَزَلَتِ المعوذتان. Until the mu'awwidhatan, قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقُ قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ were revealed. Once they were revealed, Abu Sa'id al-Khudri says in this narration, فَلَمَّا نَزَلَتَا أَخَذَ بِهِمَا وَتَرَكَ مَا سِوَاهُمَا When they were revealed, he would make use of them. And he abandoned everything else. Everything else he used to seek Allah's protection with, from al-jinn and from evils, he left it all out. And he would only now use Surah Al-Falaq or Surah Al-Nas. For this, يعني, subhanallah, يعني, the one who complains about the evil eye, well, jinn and harms and evils, he's the solution. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam abandoned everything and only stuck to these for the rest of his life and taught us so. There's another hadith concerning its virtue. Uqba ibn Amir radiyallahu anhu, he says, Tabi'atu Rasulallah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa huwa raakibun fajaaltu aw fajaaltu yadi ala qadamayh. Uqba ibn Amir, he says, I was riding behind the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Uqba, he put his hands on the legs of Rasulallah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to keep perhaps himself balanced on the, on the, on the animal that they were on. Faqultu, then Uqbah said to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya Rasulullah, aqri'ni imma min surati Hudin wa imma min surati Yusuf. He said, O Messenger of Allah, can you read to me surat Hud or surat Yusuf? Now, he's, he's requesting from him to read something from these two suwar in order to seek protection. Seeking Allah azza wa jal's protection through some ayat of surat Hud and surat Yusuf. So then the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Ya Uqbat, Ya Uqbat ibn Amir, innaka lan taqra'a suratan ahabba ila Allah ta'ala wa la ablaga indahu min an taqra'a qul a'udhu bi rabbi al-falaq. He said to him, Ya Uqbat, he said to him, the most beloved 
and complete and greatest surah that you will read whenever seeking Allah's protection from the evil eye and other types of harms would be Surah Al-Falaq. And in other narrations, Surah Al-Nas alongside with that. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to him, فَإِنِ اسْتَطَعْتَ أَلَّا تَفُوتَكَ فِي صَلَاةٍ فَفْعَلْ If you're able to read it in the prayer, then do so. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it has been narrated that he would recite this two surah, he recited it in Salat al-Fajr, in the first rak'ah, قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ In the next rak'ah, قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ For see this, يعني, subhanallah, what's incredible here is that look how great our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is. He was so concerned for the Sahaba and for his ummah that he would always give them the best advice possible. You see, Uqbah, he said to Rasulullah, read something from Surah Hud or something from Surah Yusuf. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam could have read some of this and some of that. But he directed him and he advised him to that which is the best. And he said to him, the best, most beloved, complete and greatest surah that will offer you the protection of Allah azza wa jal when you're seeking his protection would be al muawwidatain And he said to him, if'al, do so and read that. Uqbah radiallahu anhu would now commit to this advice of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And one more hadith concerning the virtue of these two suwar, and that is again, Uqbah ibn Amir radiallahu anhu, he says, بَيْنَمَا أَنَا, سي... بينما أنا أَسِيرُ مَعَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ بَيْنَ الْجُحْفَةِ وَالْأَبْوَاءِ He said, as I was traveling with the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and we reached an area between al-juhfa and al abwa these are two cities in, in, يعني, in, in the Arabian Peninsula, in Saudi, next to Mecca. He says, as we were traveling, إِذْ غَشِيَتْنَا رِيحٌ وَظُلْمَةٌ شَدِيدًا All of a sudden, a wind and an intense darkness enveloped us. The weather changed, it became very dark, stormy, and it was very windy. Then the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam began يتعوذ. He began to seek Allah's protection. بي. أعوذ برب الفلق وأعوذ برب الناس. He began to seek Allah's protection with these two suwar. And then he said to عقبة رضي الله عنه, he said, يا عقبة, تعوذ بهما فما تعوذ متعوذ بمثلهما. He said to him, oh عقبة, when you are seeking the protection of Allah, you're seeking protection from harms and evils and from anything that can hurt you. He said, then seek Allah's protection with these two suwar. For no one can use anything else that would compare to them for this purpose. The purpose of seeking Allah Azza wa Jal's protection. Uqba added in this narration that I heard the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam read these suwar when he led the people in prayer. For that's concerning its virtues. And يعني, you get the idea and the image that Whenever you're engaging in the act of al-isti'adha, the best possible thing you can ever say and utter when seeking Allah's protection would be from Allah's word, from the Qur'an, and that is قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ Now, we move on to Surah Al-Falaq. Let's discuss something about its placement and the difference between Al-Falaq and Nas. You see, the surah before was surah al-ikhlas. That's what you read first thing in the morning, three times. Once you move on to surah al-falaq, you still need to remember that surah al-ikhlas was about your iman in Allah. It was about at tawheed the oneness of Allah azza wa jal. Right? This is what surah al-ikhlas was about. When you move on to surah al-falaq or surah al-nas, now you're being told, that this tawheed and iman inside of you could be damaged by external harms and internal harms. Surah Al-Falaq, now you're seeking Allah's protection from external harms, harms that are outside. And we'll go through them one after the other. O Surah Al-Nas, you're seeking Allah's protection from an internal harm. And that is, Al-Waswas Al-Khannas Al-Ladhi Yuwaswisu Fi Sudur Al-Nas. Faithan, that's the placement and the arrangement of these suwar. There is al-ikhlas, and then two suwar come after to tell you you need to be careful. This tawheed that is in your heart could be damaged. 
if you do not seek Allah's protection from external harms and internal harms. Surah Al-Falaq, my brothers and sisters in Islam, is made up of five ayat. And the central theme and the message of this surah is to teach us that we are in continuous need of the protection of Allah Azza wa Jal. Generally, from all types of evils that he created, min sharri ma khalaq, and then more specifically, from the evils of the night, min sharri ghasiqin idha waqab, more specifically from the evil of the magicians, wa min sharri naffathati fil uqad, and from the evil of the envia, wa min sharri hasidin idha hasad. And so in other words, any kind of evil a person is afflicted with, these two suwar are a treatment for it, and a protection from it. Now, what is the relationship of Surah Al-Falaq with Surah Al-Ikhlas that came before it? Listen to this very carefully. Number one, Surah Al-Ikhlas was about the complete praise of Allah by affirming the most perfect names and attributes for Allah, right? Allahu Ahad, Allahu Samad, and also by disassociating from him all types of imperfections and flaws. لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفواً أحد. That was Surah Al-Ikhlas. Now contrary to this, Surah Al-Falaq and An-Nas are about our weakness, our incompleteness, our imperfection. And that we are continuously in need of Allah Azzawajal's protection from all the evils and the harms. And if we don't have Allah's protection, we will definitely be harmed. Not only our physical bodies, but also our iman will be damaged. And this is a beautiful uh, relationship. Surah Al-Akhlas about the perfection of Allah, Surah Al-Falaq Al-Nas about our weakness, our imperfection, and that we are always in need of Allah Al-Ahad, Al-Samad. The second relationship, Surah Al-Ikhlas, there was Allah Al-Samad within that surah. And we remember, and we all remember that Al-Samad means that we are in need of Allah Azza wa Jal, and He is not in need of us. So then Surah Al-Falaq came, to explain our desperate need of Allah Azza wa Jal. And one of the greatest needs we have in this life that can only be given to you by Allah is protection from evils and harms. فَإِذَنْ Allah الصَّمَدْ Allah الصَّمَدْ We desperately need Him. He doesn't need us. And one of the greatest things we need from Him is to continuously protect us from all types of evils and all types of harms. And the third and the last <clears throat> um, relationship I share with you is this. Pay attention, this is all important because as you're reading these surah in the morning and in the afternoon, you need to be reflecting as to why I'm reading them three times. Our deen makes sense. And the biggest problem with people and youth today, when they turn away from the teachings of Allah and His Messenger, most of the times it's because I don't understand it. He doesn't understand what he's reading. Right? And this could cause a problem. It could cause a serious issue. And you know, subhanAllah, on, on this occasion, you know, today, Salman Rushdi was stabbed today multiple times in New York before he gave a presentation. He didn't even have the time to do so. But this person um, yani, has disbelieved in Allah Azza wa Jal and in his messenger. And he wrote a book. He called it the Satanic Verses. He refers to the Quran as being the words of the shaitan. Allah. But he has a story that he mentions. When he was in India, he says in one of his clips, he said, I was in India and I grew up with my father and my father used to take me to Salat al-Eid. His father used to take him to the Eid prayer. And he said, I used to go to the Eid prayer and I'd tell my father, what am I doing here? So his father would say to him, son, just do what I'm doing. Follow what I'm doing. And then he goes, all we're doing is actions up, down, going back down, coming back up, and he said 97% of the Indian population has no clue what Arabic is. They don't understand Arabic. And the khatib is speaking in Arabic, and the salat is all in Arabic, and I had no clue what was happening. He said, I believe that Islam was a false religion from the age of 9 or the age of 10. Hala, this is his ignorance. He related his kufr, and he gave explanation to his kufr because he didn't understand anything in Islam, subhanAllah. And he never made an attempt after this to ever understand what was happening. How silly is this? You leave Islam because you didn't understand it. 
or you didn't even make an attempt to understand it. Alhamdulillah, that he exposed himself. He exposed himself, and this kind of explanation doesn't work. Now, of course, you need to seek the knowledge. You need to learn what you're doing. So to avoid something like this, it is always important for a believer that you save yourself from this kind of misconception. This is no doubt a doubt that can strike a person's heart any time. Why am I doing all this? What's all this up and down? What are these adhkar? I'm reading Ayat al-Kursi once. I'm reading Surah al-Ikhlas three times, al-Falaq three times. What is happening? For as a result, a person that doesn't understand, a shaitan will take the better of him and he'll instill within him evil whispers. And as a result, he is now uh, in doubt of his religion and the teachings of his religion. And he finds himself leaving Islam. We ask Allah Azza wa to protect us. فَإِذَنْ Let's understand one more of these relationships between Surah Al-Ikhlas or Surah Al-Falaq. You see, Surah Al-Ikhlas, it discussed the greatest concept ever. And that was At-Tawheed. La ilaha illallah. That is the greatest concept ever. And it is absolutely certain, and it is a fact, that anyone who embraces the genuine proper Tawheed through Surah Al-Ikhlas and actually believes that there is one Lord worthy of worship, then if you believe this and you practice it and you preach it, no doubt you will be harmed. You will be harmed. You'll be a subject for attackers. You'll be harmed. Allah Azza wa Jal, He said, أَحَسِبَ النَّاسُ أَن يُتْرَكُوا أَن يَقُولُوا آمَنَّا وَهُمْ لَا يُفْتَنُونَ Did the people assume that they will say, آمَنَّا, we believe in Allah, and they will be left without being tested? That's not going to happen. Anyone who says, لا إله إلا الله, and commits to this word, and makes it his flag in life, and upholds this word, and implements it and preaches it, will be harmed, will be tested. No doubt. As you're reading this surah in the morning and in the evening, you're reminding yourself of this reality. Allah Azza wa Jal, he said, وَمَا نَقَمُوا مِنْهُمْ إِلَّا أَن يُؤْمِنُوا بِاللَّهِ الْعَزِيزِ الْحَمِيدِ About Ashab al-Ukhdud. That they, the only reason why the king burnt 20,000 plus or minus of them at the time was just because they believed in Allah al-Aziz al-Hamid, nothing else. Even whoever upholds the Tawheed will be harmed. So as a result, you need to seek Allah's protection. For Surah Al-Ikhlas came, or Surah Al-Nas came. We even in Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he began to preach La Ilaha Illallah, as he stood on the mountain of As-Safa and he told his people La Ilaha Illallah, the first harm he received was from his own family, his own uncle, Abu Lahab, who turned and said to him, Tabbal laka ali hadha jama'atana. He cursed him. He cursed the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is verbal abuse. The harm already started from just by saying, people say la ilaha illallah. And the harm started from then. And then he and his companions were harmed throughout their life in Mecca for the next 13 years. And then when they moved to al Madina until, يعني, finally Allah Azza wa Jal gave the believers with Islam victory over their enemies. So Surah Al-Ikhlas, Surah Al-Falaq comes after Surah Al-Ikhlas to teach us that you'll ex be exposed to a great deal of harm and evil. Whether these evils are external, as we'll see in this surah, or whether it's internal, which is al-waswas, al-shaytan. لأن الشيطان, no doubt, his waswas upon the believer is going to be more than anyone else. Because everyone else is on his side anyway. They're going with him to Jahannam anyway, so it doesn't work much on them. But he's working more on the believer to grab him and put him to his side. And this is why Ibn, uh, I think it was Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, when the Jews came to him and they said to him, Inna la nuwaswasu fi salatina. We don't experience any waswas in our, in our salat. This is what a Jewish man said to Ibn Mas'ud. We Jews don't have waswas in our salat like you people sometimes complain to your messenger. For then Ibn Mas'ud, he said to him, وَمَا يَفْعَلُ الشَّيْطَانُ بِقَلْبٍ خَرَابٍ What is the shaytan going to do with a ruined, destroyed heart anyway? Me, people are all destroyed. You're on his side. What's he going to give you? A swas of what? For even his intense waswas is going to be upon the believers, upon those who believe in Allah and follow the Messenger. As a result, once you're aware of this fact, and you've said, Qul Allahu Ahad in the morning, 
and you're certain and firm of its meanings and you're implementing it, then understand, harm will come. So what do you need? You need Allah's protection. For either now you start reading Surah Al-Falaq or Surah Al-Nas afterwards. Allah Azza wa Jalla began this surah by saying, قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ قُلْ Say, this is an address from Allah to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And what this implies is that if the most beloved of Allah's creation, which is Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he is commanded to seek and enter Allah's protection, it only leaves us to imagine how much more we are in need of Allah's protection. This command, it was coming to Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam first and foremost, Imagine this, and he's guaranteed the paradise. Allah Azza wa has already removed the evil traits of the devils from the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from a young age. When the angels came and they cut him open and took his heart and removed Havdu Shaytani Min, the evil traits and the qualities of the devil, for Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was purified. And his shaytan accepted Islam, as he would say to Aisha radiallahu anha, that Allah Azza wa helped me and aided me upon my shaytan. But now, what, what, what does that leave the rest of us? Imagine how much more we are in need. One Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is reading this surah every day. Three in the morning, three in the evening, before sleep, after as salat and, and during his prayers. And, yeah, and you can just imagine how much more we are in need of Allah's protection through these two surah. So, قُلْ قُلْ You, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, say, and as an extension, your ummah should follow in your footsteps and also say, Qul here also, it implies that Allah wants the human being, us as believers, to announce our weakness on our tongue. Announce your weakness. Allah wants the human being to see that he's weak. To see on his tongue that he needs Allah's help and he's desperate for it. Qul a'udhu bi rabbil falaq. Say it. Announce it. Show your weakness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some humans are arrogant. And the ego will prevent them from asking anything from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah azza wa is telling us to humble ourselves and ask him, ask him out loud. The one who continues to ask Allah azza wa for anything, a dua, for protection, such a person is humble to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is a sign of humility. The word qul, it is removing arrogance from the heart. Allah azza wa wants to remove every atom of pride and arrogance from the heart of the believing servants. And this is why? The previous surah was what? Surah Al-Ikhlas. And this surah, if you're able to always seek Allah's protection, that is a sign of sincerity. That's the other relationship. Surah Al-Ikhlas before, sincerity. But how am I gonna, how, how, what are the signs that I am sincere? Seek Allah's protection. Continue to seek Allah's protection. Do not stop. And that is a good sign that you are sincere in your worship and your love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ The word أَعُوذُ, this is perhaps, this is the big word in this surah and the surah after. This is what you need to understand. This is an entire ibadah in Islam. It's called الْإِسْتِعَاذَة. This is a worship of the heart. It's called الْإِسْتِعَاذَة. And this comes at the beginning of every surah. أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ Or whenever you're going to read the Qur'an, أَعُوذُ comes from the word عَاذَ. عَاذَ means to cling and hang on to something for protection. To hang on to something or someone for protection. And you, you're clinging so hard that you will not let go and you're seeking protection of something that is dangerous and evil and you're afraid from. These are the meanings of أَعُوذُ. Now, it also comes from the word al-uwadh and al-awwadh. Listen to how beautiful this is. A'udhu comes from the word al-uwadh. What is al-uwadh? Al-uwadh is the shrubs and the small plants that grow right next to a tree. So you have the bottom of a tree. What grows around the tree, in Arabic it's called al-uwadh. And so these plants and shrub that grow night, right next to the tree, they are the most protected by the tree. The idea is, the one who commits to this ibadah of al-isti'adha and continues to seek Allah's protection, then they are the most protected of Allah's creation. That's the idea. 
They are the most protected of Allah's creation. The more you seek Allah's protection, then the more you will be protected by Allah Azza wa Jal. And it also comes from the word al awwadh This is another beautiful idea. al awwadh is actually the meat that is attached directly to the bone. So you know, when there's a lamb or whatever it is that you're cooking, the meat that is attached to the bone this is the best and most tastiest meat of the entire animal that you sacrificed. The meat that is attached to the bone. They say that, أَطْيَبُ اللَّحْمِ عَوَّذَهُ The best of the meat is that which is attached directly to the bone. So the idea here is this, that the more a person makes isti'adha, the more you're committed to this worship of seeking Allah's protection, the closer you are to Allah Azza wa Jal. And as a result, you will be the best and in the most purest state and condition. Yani the, the more isti'adha in your life, the more pure you are. And the best of the creation in the sight of Allah Azza wa Jal. The most beloved and the best of the creation of Allah are those who continue to seek His protection. Because when you seek Allah's protection, this is a show of your sincerity. This is a show of your need of Allah Azza wa Jal. You are displaying the name of Allah, as samad in your life. That I am in need of you. Subhanallah. Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah, he commented on the word, A'udhu. And he said the reality of this word. Listen to this beautiful example. He said the reality of A'udhu is to run away from that which you fee to the one who will protect you. So the one who is seeking protection is rushing to the one who can protect him. This is A'udhu. You're running with your heart, with your soul, with your body, with absolute attachment and trust and certainty that he will protect me. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, he gave a small example so he can bring the meaning even closer. He said, imagine there's a child and he was chased by the enemy. And the enemy had the weapon out. They had the sword unsheathed and in front of his face. And the enemy is running after this child. And the child is terrified. He's scared. Harm is going to get him very soon. So he begins to run. As a result, he sees his father appear in front of him. So he throws himself on his father. And he holds on to him tightly. And he clings on to him. Allahu Akbar. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, he says, this is just an example of what a'udhu means. Otherwise, he said, the word a'udhu carries a greater meaning than this example. Because when you run to Allah azza wa jal, Allah Azza wa Jal will most definitely, certainly protect you. Unlike in the example, here your attachment to your father, but, but to Allah Azza wa Jal, it is much more, much more intense. And you'll notice in this surah, Rabbil Falaq, Rabbil Nas, Malikin Nas, Ilahin Nas, this is who you're attaching to. Al Malik wal Rabb wal Ilah, Allah. Fa'idhan, if that's who you're attaching to, most definitely, he's the one who created whatever harm is going to follow you. And most definitely, he can protect you from that. Subhanallah. Allah Azza wa Jal, he informed us about men who sought the protection of other than Allah. They sought the protection of al-jinn. And listen to what happened. In Surah al-Jinn, Allah Azza wa Jal, he says, وَأَنَّهُ كَانَ رِجَالٌ مِّنَ الْإِنسِ يَعُوذُونَ بِرِجَالٍ مِّنَ الْجِنِّ فَزَادُوهُمْ رَهَقًا You know, this is a story. Uh, Ibn Abbas mentions that the Arabs when they used to travel in the desert and they would arrive at a valley before they enter this valley they would stand at the mouth of the valley and they would say they would say we seek protection from the master of this valley meaning the devils and the jinn that he protect us from everything evil that is in this valley they would say this before they enter the valley. And then they would walk, hoping that the jinn would protect them from the evil until they reached the other side. You know what happened? Because they sought the protection of other than Allah, Allah Azza wa Jal gives the result and he says, فَزَادُوهُمْ رَهَقًا Al-jinn only increased these men in fee and terror and pain and sadness and worry. They only increased them. Yani they their matter wasn't satisfied. It wasn't fulfilled. They wanted protection. And as they went through this valley, because they sought other than Allah's protection, they were more fearful. 
and more terrified. Subhanallah. This is the result of anyone who turns to other than Allah for protection. You turn to other than Allah for protection, the only result you will see, زَادُوهُمْ rahaqa. Your pain will be increasing. That's the only result. Now, for ultimately, protection is only sought from Allah Azza wa Jal and no one else. Everyone else is a means. If you needed someone's protection for a specific matter and he's able to protect you, that's permissible, no problems. But you didn't rely on him. You didn't attach to him. That's just the worldly means. Can fail, it can pass. That you're attached to Allah. He's the one who's ultimately going to provide this protection. And he's the one who will protect me through whoever you're seeking protection of in this life. For this is a very important meaning to understand. Now, قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ The word أَعُوذُ, it's a present tense, meaning I am continuously seeking his protection. And أَعُوذُ is the action itself. Yani you did not say قُلْ أَسْتَعِيذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ or قُلْ أَسْتَعِيذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ Well, there's a difference between أَعُوذُ and أَسْتَعِيذُ. You know, when you say seeking Allah's forgiveness, what do you say? What do you say? Astaghfirullah. You see this? As. What does that mean? I seek Allah's forgiveness. As meaning I seek Allah's forgiveness. Right? وَإِذْ إِسْتَسْقَى مُوسَى لِقَوْمِهِ When Musa asked water from Allah for his people. This as in Arabic means I'm asking, I'm seeking. So here it's not قُلْ أَسْتَعِيذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ قُلْ أَعُوذُ What's the difference? أَسْتَعِيذُ means I'm seeking this protection. I'm asking for it. But أَعُوذُ is the action, the protection itself. Meaning أَعُوذُ means I've given up. I'm submitted. I've submitted myself and entered into your protection. I'm not even seeking it. I'm already in there. That's how desperate I am for it. I'm already in. I'm not even seeking it. I believe that I'm in there because that's how much I'm in need of it. Qul a'udhu bi rabbil falaq. Subhanallah. Now, and so, you know, what's incredible here is that Surah Al-Falaq, how much have we spoken about it for about 20 minutes, 25 minutes? All of what we've spoken, you've already in your mind seen how huge this Surah is and what a relief this Surah is for a believer. And what's beautiful is that this is from the very first Surah that each and every single one of us have memorized when we were children. See this? This is a mercy of Allah Azza wa Jal. This is the wisdom of Allah Azza wa Jal. There is not a single Muslim household, a seven-year-old, eight-year-old, not except that he knows this surah. And how much have we been speaking about the importance of this surah and how beautiful is it to know that all of us know it? What is left is for you to begin to implement and understand. And how many times has Allah saved us from evil and harm because of our recitation of this surah, but you have no idea. How many times has this surah saved us, but we have no clue, no idea. On the day of judgment, you'll find out what this surah did in your life and how it protected. But the faith, once again, you need to have this faith in Allah Azza wa Jal and understand that this surah is, is, is working. This surah is working. Without this surah in your life, Allah, Allah alam what would have happened. قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ Rabbi al-Falaq, the Lord of al-Falaq. You see the word Rabb is used here. As opposed to the previous surah, it was the word Allah. Qul huwa Allahu ahad, Allahu samad. Here the word Rabb. Why? Because surah al-Ikhlas was about al-Tawheed, the oneness of Allah. And the most suitable name for al-Tawheed is Allah. Whereas surah al-Falaq is about protection from evil. And the most suitable name of Allah when seeking his protection is his name al-Rabb. Because al-Rabb is the one who created and he's the one who maintains and he controls. And all of these matters are under his name, Ar-Rabb. And this is under yani the, the category of Tawheedu Ar-Rububiyyah. Now, and, and, and this is why we're learning that you need to use appropriate names of Allah for whatever you're seeking and asking. You're asking for his protection, use his name, Ar-Rabb. Al-Falaq, the Lord of the Daybreak. Al-Falaq comes from the word Falaqa. Falaqa means to tear and to split something, to rip something apart. Therefore, Everything that explodes and splits up is called falaq. And there are two opinions for ulama here. One is that al-falaq is the daybreak, the light of the dawn. So the idea is, Allah Azza wa Jal said, فَالِقُ الْإِصْبَاحِ You know, at Fajr time, there is a light that splits the darkness of the night 
It's a horizontal line, a white horizontal line that appears in the sky. And then it begins to grow and grow and grow until the day begins to emerge. That's falaq. Allah Azza wa said, Faliqul Isbah. Faliqul Isbah. He's the one who causes the darkness of the night to tear and rip, and he brings out the light. The other meaning for falaq is anything that splits. So, number one, it's the light of the fajr as it tears through the darkness of the night. And the second opinion is anything that splits is falaq. Allah Azza wa he said, Thaliqul Habbi wa Nawa. It is Allah who causes the seeds to split. The wheat seed, it splits, and then the plant starts coming out. The corn seed, it splits, and then it, the plant comes out. The fruit seed, or the fruit stone, it splits, and then the plant comes out. And then when the seedling is growing, the earth splits, and the plant emerges. And also the womb of any, whether it's from mankind or animals, the womb splits, and a baby comes out. The egg, it splits, it hatches, and life comes out. The idea here, the ulama would say, anything that splits gives birth to something. And everything splits. Everything splits. You have يعني, uh, the clouds, they split and rain comes out. The spring of the earth, the earth splits and spring comes out. The earthquakes, they split the earth. قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ I am seeking the protection of the Lord of everything that splits. Was Zajjaj rahimahullah, he said, all the creation of Allah is falaq. If you reflect over this concept, you'll realize that originally everything splits. All the plants and trees and animals, everything in the universe. Allah Azza wa Jalla says, أَوَلَمْ يَرَى الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا أَنَّ السَّمَاوَاتُ وَالْأَرْضَ كَانَتَا رَتْقًا فَفَتَقْنَاهُمَا The earth and the sky were together. And then Allah Azza wa Jalla split them. They were joined first. Then they were split apart. And notice, we said everything that splits causes something to come out. Something is given birth to. The previous surah was, Lam yalid wa lam yulad. He wasn't born, nor did he is a father or a mother, nor is he a father to anyone. And he wasn't born. And now this surah is describing everything he created as falaq. He didn't come out of anyone, nor anyone came out of him. He created everything. So everything Allah has created has pairs. Because it's come out of something. From everything we have created, we created in pairs. And everything Allah created, we said splits and something comes out of it. Well, subhanAllah, there's a beautiful usage of this word in this surah. There's optimism. This is a positive word. It's full of hope, full of light and brightness for our lives. As the word suggests, al-falaq, the light as it breaks the darkness of the night. Now the rest of the surah is going to be about hidden dark evils. Ash-sharr, this is associated to darkness. Ghasiq, this is darkness. An-nafathat, magicians, that's darkness. Hasidin, that's a dark emotion of the heart, envy and jealousy. And so the Lord of Al-Falaq, of everything that splits, He is able to rip and tear through all the problems in your life. See the beautiful, uh, uh, the, this, is, this is the positive aspect of this word. It is like Allah Azza wa is giving openness and relaxation for the heart of the believer every morning when he reads this surah and in the evening when he reads it. That those dark, difficult times that you have, he is the Lord of Al-Falaq. He can split and tear this darkness and this problem in your life and bring out the light, bring out the comfort, bring out the peace and the tranquility. And it could be from the same problem you're suffering that you will find ease and comfort. Like Ibrahim alayhi salam, he's thrown in a fire. And this becomes a peace and tranquility for him. A fire. Subhanallah. That's the idea. Naam. So, قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ He's bringing hope that Allah Azza wa Jal can protect the believer. And he can remove all the evils and the harms that are in his life. Now four evils are mentioned. من شر ما خلق ومن شر غاسق إذا وقب ومن شر النفاثات في العقد ومن شر حاسد إذا حسد. Listen, this surah is arranged in a remarkably eloquent sequence. It transitions from what's general to what's more specific. The first evil that was mentioned is the evil of whatever he created. من شر ما خلق. Every evil that Allah عز وجل created is the first thing you're seeking Allah's protection from. Then. 
it gets more specific. You see, more general. Then more specific. What's more specific than that? وَمِن شَرِّ غَاسِقٍ إِذَا وَقَبْ And I seek Allah's protection from the evil of the darkness as it enters. And then النفاثات from the magicians and then from الحاسد the envier. Because the magician only works when he's envied someone. So it goes from what's uh, general to what's more specific until it gets to the root cause of the evil which is الحاسد. And we're going to speak about this. So مِن شَرِّ مَا خَلَقْ a sharr is evil, and it's opposite to khair. A sharr is evil that causes harm. That's a sharr. Evil that can cause harm. It's like the word sharar. You know in the Arabic, the spark, when you're, when you're igniting a, a matchstick or whatever it is, and a spark comes out. This, in Arabic, it's called sharar. And that can burn a person. If that hits you, that can burn a person. It can cause harm. Therefore, sharr is evil that causes harm. So you're seeking Allah's protection from a sharr, from the evil that may cause harm of whatever He created, min sharri ma khalaq. And so the idea here that you need to know is that did Allah create the evil? Because He's saying min sharri ma khalaq. So how we answer this is we say this: Look, Allah Azza wa created everything, every single thing He created. He created the evil, but we do not ascribe the evil to Allah. Allah Azza wa Jal, He said, بِيَدِكَ الْخَيْرِ In His hand is only the goodness. When Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would say, وَالشَّرُّ لَيْسَ إِلَيْكَ Evil is not ascribed to you. So we do not ascribe evil to Allah Azza wa Jal. And there is nothing absolutely evil in whatever Allah Azza wa Jal created. Nothing is 100% evil in what Allah created. لَيْسَ فِي خَلْقِ اللَّهِ شَرٌ مَحْضٍ As Ibn Al-Qayyim رحمه الله, He mentions. So then, uh, Sheikh Ibn Uthaymeen rahimahullah, he gave a, a good understanding to this topic and he said that what Allah Azzawajal created is of three types. There is something that is purely evil in its creation but there is goodness in it such as the hellfire. This is purely evil but in terms of its wisdoms, it's good. It's a place for the arrogant and the rebellious and those who rejected Allah to burn in. Iblis was shaitan all of him and his creation is evil but the wisdom for why Allah created it from that perspective it's good that this is a test for mankind who's going to adhere to his faith and who's going to seek Allah's protection over him and who's going to invite this person into his life and be one with him for there is goodness from the perspective of its wisdom and then there is pure good in what Allah created such as the angels the prophets uh, the, the, the paradise and then there is things that have good and bad in them. And that is like uh, uh, mankind. Uh, you can say also uh, from among al-jinn as well. There is good and there is bad. Sicknesses as well. There is good, there is bad to sickness as well. The good is that it wipes away a person's sins, elevates his ranks with Allah Azza wa Jalla and so on. For even this is when we're saying min sharri ma khalaq, we are asking Allah Azza wa Jalla to protect us from the evils of what he created. From the evil aspect of that which he subhanahu wa ta'ala created. Now, and this ayah has a profound lesson. And that is that Allah Azza wa informed us that we are to seek his protection from the evils he created. Min sharri ma khalaq. For Allah Azza wa mentioned that he created them. Therefore, he established his authority and rule over everything. And since he created that which is evil, and it's not ascribed to him subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore, the only one that can protect you from it is who? The one who created it, which is Allah Azza wa Jal. So within the surah, there is a reason for why you shouldn't turn to anyone else to protect you from evils and harms. And once you understand this lesson, it proves that your recitation of the previous surah, Surah Al-Ikhlas, is true and it's genuine. Then there was tawheed in that and this now is that tawheed concept. Those who turn to other means for protection, such as al-hijab, the amulets that people do, write some words in it, put it on your son's uh, shoulder for protection, all of that is deficiency in tawheed. And if a person actually believed this is protecting him, this is kufr, he has disbelieved. And if a person believes this is a means for protection, and the ultimate protector is Allah, this is uh, shirk al-asghar, it's still shirk. And the blue eye as well, that people put in their businesses or in their um, status, a blue eye in the status. 
all of this, if you took this as a means, believing Allah is the ultimate protector, shirk wa nasgar, dangerous. And if you actually believe this is what's bringing you the protection, khalas, the person, remember, there's, there's no more la ilaha illallah. The person will die as a kafir. We ask Allah Azza wa to save us. Now it gets more specific. وَمِن شَرِّ غَاسِقٍ إِذَا وَقَبْ And we're seeking the protection of Allah from the evil of al-ghasiq إِذَا وَقَبْ Now there are two opinions for al-ghasiq and they don't contradict each other, they complete each other. Number one, al-ghasiq is the complete darkness of the night. يعني they say غَسَقَتِ الْعَيْنِ إِذَا امْتَلَأَتْ دَمْعًا An eye if it's full with tears, then in Arabic they say, غَسَقَتِ العين. And if a wound is full with blood, they say, غَسَقَتِ الْجِرَاحَ أو الْجُرْحُ That the, the wound is full of blood. So, الْغَاسِق is when the night is so, so dark, there's absolutely no light left. You know, because at Maghrib time there's still light. And as the hours go by, it gets darker and darker and darker until it becomes pitch black. Until you cannot even see the size of a tree. How high is the tree? You can't even see anything. And you can't even see a size of a mountain. There could, there could be a big mountain in front of you. You cannot even see it. Because it has been enveloped by the darkness of the night. So, min sharri ghasiqin. The other opinion is that al ghasiq is the moon itself. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Aisha radiallahu anha narrated, that Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam took her hand. He held her hand at night. They were standing outside. And he said to her, to look at the moon. And then he said to her, Ya Aisha, Ista'eedhi billahi min sharri hadha, fa inna hadha al-ghasiqu idha waqab. Seek Allah's protection from this. Because this is the ghasiq idha waqab, when it enters. This is the ghasiq, the moon, when it enters. And we said there's no contradiction between these two opinions because the moon is a sign of the night. The moon only appears at night. Therefore we're seeking the protection of Allah Azza wa Jal, the Lord of Al-Falaq, the Lord of the light of the morning, from the evil of whatever he created, and the evil of the very darkness of the night, whenever it enters. Waqab, waqab when it enters. Al-wuqub, dukhulu al-zalami fi shay. Waqab, when the darkness enters. And I explained to you, it enters so much, that even if there's, if there's a light, if, if there's a car driving towards you, you will not know. And if he's got his headlights on, maybe that's two motorbikes. Maybe it's a car, maybe it's a truck, you have no clue. But it's because of what? Because of how dark it is. This is al ghasiq whenever it enters. Now, طيب, why was this mentioned? The darkness of the night specifically. Because when the darkness settles, that's when evil is rampant. That's when the crimes happen. Crimes take place at night. Shootings and murders take place at night. Magicians get to work at night. Drugs and alcohol, nightclubs. The emergency rooms of the hospital are very full Friday night and Saturday night and Sunday night. The R-rated programs on TV, they're all at night, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, in the pitch black of the night. A lot of crimes happen. A lot of evil happens at this night. The shayateen are active at this time. So as a result, and, and this is a time as well, if you're outside, insects come to life, biting and poisoning uh, whoever's there. So you're seeking Allah Azza wa Jal's protection. From the darkness of the night, whenever it enters. Subhanallah, when Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he warned us about the night and its evils. Listen to this hadith. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, إِذَا كَانَ جُنْحُ اللَّيْلِ كُفُّوا صِبْيَانَكُمْ As soon as the night enters, pack your children away. Put them inside the home. صِبْيَانَكُمْ وَالصَّبِي As the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would say, وَالصَّبِيُّ حَتَّى يَبْلُغْ Yani as sabi is the one who hasn't reached the age of puberty yet. So anything of children under the age of puberty, as soon as the night enters, which is from Maghrib time, take them and put them inside the house. It is not allowed for them to be outside. طيب. Ibn Hajar rahimahullah explains something important here. He says, is this something that we have to do and put the children inside when it becomes Maghrib time? He said, no. But listen to his explanation. He said, this was the default instruction of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because children under the age of puberty, what is assumed is that they do not read their adhkar. 
They don't read the adhkar. As a result, there is no protection. So put them inside because the devils are released at night. However, if a child under the age of puberty was to read the adhkar, especially ayat al-kursi, wal-ikhlas wal-mu'awwidhatayn, then Ibn Hajar rahimahullah says, it is allowed to leave the children outside. And there is no need to bring them in the house when the night begins. For that's the idea. This is what is meant by the hadith, Wallahu alam. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then he says, فَإِذَا ذَهَبَ سَاعَةٌ مِّنَ اللَّيْلِ فَخَلُّوهُمْ When a few moments, perhaps 45 minutes of the night has passed by, you allow your children to leave after this. Then he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, وَأَغْلِقُ الْأَبْوَابِ Lock the doors. See this? All these, these, these are instructions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What to do at night and how to protect yourself. أَغْلِقُ الْأَبْوَابِ Lock the doors. وَذْكُرُ اسْمَ اللَّهِ Make mention of Allah's name through the adhkar. Such as, بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الَّذِي لَا يَضُرُّ مَعَ اسْمِهِ شَيْهُمْ فِي الْأَرْضَ وَلَا فِي السَّمَاءُ وَالسَّمِعُ الْعَلِيمُ Reading al-mu'awwithat and so on. فَإِنَّ الشَّيْطَانَ لَا يَفْتَحُ بَابًا مُغْلَقًا If the door is locked, the shaytan does not open a locked door. So if the door is locked, a shaytan will not open that. Then the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, وَأَوْكِئُوا قِرَبَكُمْ وَذْكُرُ اسْمَ اللَّهِ وَخَمِّرُوا آنِيَتَكُمْ وَذْكُرُ اسْمَ اللَّهِ Cover the jugs and cover the pots and the water bottles. Everything you have in your house of pots and jugs, whatever it is that you leave on the stove open, you must cover this as the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says. And he says, and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would say, وَلَوْ أَن تَعْرِضُوا عَلَيْهِ شَيْئًا Even if it was, you know, the wooden spoon that is used to stir the things that are in a pot, even if you used a wooden spoon to just put it on top of the pot, that's enough. Not necessarily closing it with a lid, just put something on top of it. Put something on top, because there is a disease that comes down, a sickness that comes down. Once a year, Allahu alam when it comes down. And as a result, the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's concern for this ummah, cover, cover these things up with kuru Allah. And then the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, وَأَطْفِئُوا مَصَابِحَكُمْ Turn off the lights. See, all this is happening at night. Turn off the light. Turn off the candle. Turn off the candle. Why? Because this candle or this light could be a reason for why the house burns. And this was a, uh, a story that happened to Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That once the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was in his ha- in house and a mouse came in and it went to the candle and it took the wick, you know the, the, that string, that candle wick, it took the wick and it dropped it before Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on a mat which he was on, he was sitting on it. As a result, it burned a hole the size of a dirham. Then the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, إِذَا نِمْتُمْ فَأَطْفِئُوا سُرُجَكُمْ Whenever you go to sleep at night, turn off the candles and turn off the light. فَإِنَّ الشَّيَاطِينَ تَدُلُّ مِثْلَ هَذَا عَلَى هَذَا فَتَحْرِقَكُمْ Because the shaytan, what he does is that he guides this creature, he guides this rat, this mouse, to do what it just did right now. And as a result, it sets the house on fire. For this is something that needs to be adhered to and followed. Then Allah Azza wa Jalla says, وَمِن شَرِّ النَّفَّاثَاتِ فِي العقد وَمِن شَرِّ حَاسِدٍ إِذَا حَسَدٍ We're coming to the end. The previous ayah was about the time in which evil takes place, and that is the night. When nafathat comes from the word nafatha. Nafatha means to blow. <laughs> blow breath with some spirit. في العقد, in the knots. Uh, Allah Azza wa Jalla did not mention وَمِن شَرِّ السِّحْرِ Seeking Allah's protection from magic. No. He said, Min nafathat, Seeking Allah's protection from the magician. Not from the magic. From the magician himself. The one who practices magic. An nafathat, Because that's what the magician does. The worst type of magic is to tie knots and blow in them. The word nafathat teaches us that there is more than one type of magic. But the worst type of magic which Allah is teaching us to seek his protection from, is when the magician takes some of the belongings of a person, or it's brought to him, and he ties knots in them, and then he blows in them and reads his words of kufr and whatever it is, seeking the devil's assistance and help. Well, the magician is a mushrik anyway, he's a kafir, and he does this kind of magic. وَمِن شَرِّ النَّفَّاثَاتِ Those who blow, فِي الْعُقَدِ In the knots. 
Subhanallah. When nafathat is a plural. And this is how the magicians work. They all join together. Especially when there are big events like the Olympic Games or whatever it is, the soccer games and the matches. They actually, they join. There's a big conference for magicians every year. And they discuss these matters. How are we going to get this team to lose? And how is this team going to win? And wallahu alam what happens. But this is their evil. This is their filth. We are seeking Allah's protection from their evil. Subhanallah. Now the last ayah that comes with us. The question is, why would someone cast magic onto someone else? What's the reason? Jealousy. Jealousy. They don't want someone to succeed. They want to see them fail. So Allah Azza wa mentions the root cause of magic. And that is al-hasad. For Allah Azza wa Jal, he said, وَمِن شَرِّ حَاسِدٍ إِذَا حسد. We're concluding now. Al-hasad, my brothers and sisters in Islam, Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, wa Ibn Al-Qayyim, they said that al-hasad is to hate the blessing of Allah upon others. Whether you wish for this blessing to be removed from this person or not. هذا al-hasad. Just the fact that I hate Allah's blessing upon someone, this is hasad. And the first crime that took place in the heavens was hasad. When Allah would say to Iblis, all the angels including Iblis, to make a sajda to Adam and he refused. Then he said, Ana min. I'm better than him. This is arrogance. And the arrogance was a result of his hasad. And the first crime that took place on earth was also envy. In the story of the two sons of Adam alayhi salam, Qabil Habil. Yani, Qabil became jealous of Habil because Allah Azza had accepted from Habil and that led to the murder of his brother. Al-Hasad led to the murder from one brother to another. And so Al-Hasad is haram in Islam. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Wala tahasadu. Do not envy each other. And the fact that we are seeking protection from the envious person whenever he envies, that is already teaching us that we shouldn't envy anyone or anything. You're seeking Allah's protection from the envier whenever he envies, that therefore you shouldn't be envying. That's a bad trait. That's something you're seeking protection from. It's evil. Well, Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, he said that every single person carries this trait and quality in them. Everyone has hasad in him. Everyone. Everyone is able to be envious and jealous of others. Uh, Shaykh al-Islam, Ibn Taymiyyah, he says, al karimu man yukhfih, but the honorable, noble person is the one who fights it, suppresses it, keeps it inside, doesn't bring it out. And the wretched, evil person is the one who exposes his envy. And that's why Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam instructed us, whenever you are amazed by something of your children or your business or yourself, فَلْيُبَرِّكْ Say تَبَارَكَ اللَّهِ Say مَا شَاءَ اللَّهِ فَإِنَّ الْعَيْنَ حَقٍ Because the evil eye is a reality. It's a certainty, it's truth, it can happen. Well, the evil eye comes as a result of envy. So this hadith already shows that each and every single one of us has envy in them. But the good believer, he suppresses, conceals it inside. Notice here, Allah Azza wa Jal, he said, وَمِن شَرِّ حَاسِدٍ إِذَا حَسَدٍ You're seeking Allah's protection from the envier whenever he envies. Because we said everyone has envy in them. So you can't possibly be seeking Allah's protection from everyone. You're seeking Allah's protection from the envier when he begins to envy. When his hasad begins to come out. And how does the envy come out? How does it become apparent? That's when a person begins to talk bad about others. Backbiting others. Why would you backbite? Other than the fact that you envy this person. Criticizing others in a wrongful way. Yani, wanting to harm someone going after someone's business, that's a sign that the envy has come out. That's the person you, you're seeking Allah's protection from. You have a house. Al-Hasid hates this blessing upon you. You have a business. Al-Hasid hates that you have a business. Haq al-Hasid just wants to cause harm to others. But whenever you're seeking Allah's protection, when you're reading this surah in the morning and in the evening, then the harm of the Hasid is moved away from you. 
and the hasid will only harm himself, no one else. Al-hasid, the envier, harms himself three times. Number one, when he brings out his hasad, that's a reason for him earning sins. Number two, this is bad manners with Allah Azza wa Jal. Allah has decreed a blessing for someone. You hate Allah's blessing upon someone. Therefore, you have objected to the qadr of Allah Azza wa Jal. That's the bad thing for the hasid himself. And the third matter is that the hasid, the envier, brings pain and sadness to his heart. You envied someone. What did it do? If that person is protected by Allah's protection, you're only harming yourself. Subhanallah. فَهَذَا الْحَسَدْ It's evil. Well, finally, how does a person uh, fight the hasad within him? Because we said, every person has this quality within them. He can feel envious towards anyone. So how do we treat this? How do we suppress this and fight it? There are four methods. Bi'ithnillah, whoever was to apply this, insha'Allah, al-hasad will not damage him. And this is the perfect way to suppress and contain this hasad inside of you. Number one, whenever you feel envious about someone or the blessings that someone has, rush to saying, A'udhu billahi min shaytan rajim That's number one. Number two, make dua in secret for this person. And if need be, make it in public to him. As he's speaking, say, May Allah Azza wa bless your house. May Allah bless your car. May Allah bless your children. MashaAllah. May Allah protect them for you. The more you make dua for him, this is suppressing this envious feeling within you. Number three, talk good and in a positive manner about this person. Praise him. Because you need to fight this evil habit of hasad within you. You need to fight it. So when you speak good about someone in the presence of others, you're fighting it. And finally, don't look at what Allah Azza wa Jal has given those above you in financial status. Don't. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, do not look at those above you. Look at those who are below you financially. Why? What does this make? This would be one of the means in how you will not belittle the blessings Allah has given you. So when you look at those below you, you'll say, Alhamdulillah for what I have. I'm living in rent. Alhamdulillah, like some others are sleeping and the roof, the sky is their roof. And I got some clothes. Yeah, all right, I don't have fancy clothes and $500 clothes, but I have something. Others are walking naked. Not because he doesn't find clothes. Or others are wearing clothes. He's been wearing it for the past two weeks. Hasn't washed it because he doesn't have anything other than that. When you begin to look at those below, how can you have hazard in your life anymore? No more. It is removed. It's gone. This is how you're going to destroy al-hasad within you. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, يَهْرُمُ بْنُ آدَمْ وَيَشُبُّ مِنْهُ اثْنَيْنَ الْحِرْصُ وَالْحَسَدِ The son of Adam, he grows old, but there are two things that remain young inside a person. And that is greed and jealousy. These two things don't grow old. You don't grow out of them. They stay young in a person. You'll find someone really old and he's still greedy. And he's still envious and jealous of others. Subhanallah. And, uh, and these two things are related because uh, people are jealous because they're greedy. Jealousy comes as a result of greed. And why did I mention the hadith to finally say these two things are developing in a human from a young age? Greed and jealousy. And you'll see this a lot if you have children between brothers and sisters in the house. So the advice here for parents to make note of this. Do not uh, ignore this greed and jealousy among the brothers and sisters in the house. Do not ignore it. It's there. It's in front of you. Address it. Address it. It's tiring. It's difficult. But you need to address it. Every day, if you see a brother jealous from his brother, or his greed, he wants his things, his toys, his money, his whatever it is, you need to address this. You need to teach them, ah, this is called jealousy. This here, what you're doing is called greed, al-hirs. Allah Azza wa Jal does not like this. And you begin to teach. If you want something, ask it from Allah Azza wa Jal. You have hasad, this is how you destroy it. Address it every time. Do not ignore it. It happens two, three times. Address it two, three times in the house. You're not in the house, the wife addresses it. She's not in the house, the husband. 
Husband and wife in the house, both of you, get the children and address it. Tell them, look, huh, I am your father, this is your mother. We're not jealous of each other. And we're not, we're not greedy for what's in the hands of each other. We work together. And let them see that in you as a father and a mother. This way, if you train your children how to suppress and have a control over their jealousy and their envy, they'll be doing all right in life. Most of the problems today in life, most of the problem among people today is envy and greed. And these two things are not getting young. They are not getting old. They remain young in a person. Next surah is what? Surah to nas Or surah to nas is going to explain the greatest envier to mankind ever known. And that is a shaytan. He's the greatest. So this surah concludes. Next surah is going to teach us how to protect ourselves from the greatest of Allah's creation that envied mankind. And he continues to do so until this day. For we stop here, inshallah ta'ala. We ask Allah azza wa jal to accept our gathering, to forgive our sins, to forgive our shortcomings, to admit us into the highest levels of the paradise. In the wa thalika wal qadiru alayhi. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyyina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.